Chapter thirty four of the Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter thirty four The Old Oak of Andover a reverie silently with dreamy languor the fleecy snow is falling through the windows flowery with blossoming geranium and heliotrope through the downward sweep of crimson and muslin curtain one watches it as the wind whirls and sways it in swift eddies right opposite our house on our mount clear is an old oak the apostle of the primeval forest once when this place was all wildwood the man who was seeking a spot for the location of the buildings of phillips academy climbed this oak using it as a sort of green watch-tower from whence he might gain a view of the surrounding country age and time since then have dealt hardly with the staunch old fellow his limbs have been here and there shattered his back begins to look mossy and dilapidated but after all there is a piquant decided air about him that speaks the old age of a tree of distinction a kingly oak to-day i see him standing dimly revealed through the mist of falling snows to-morrow's sun will show the outline of his gnarled limbs all rose-coloured with their soft snow burden and again in a few months and spring will breathe on him and he will draw a long breath and break out once more for the three hundredth time perhaps into a vernal crown of leaves i sometimes think that leaves are the thoughts of trees and if we only knew it we should find their life's experience recorded in them our oak what a crop of meditations and remembrances must have been thrown forth leafing out century after century a while he spake and thought only of red deer and indians of the trillium that opened its white triangle in his shade of the scented arbutus fair as the pink ocean shell weaving her fragrant mats in the moss at his feet of feathery ferns casting their silent shadows on the checkerberry leaves and all those sweet wild nameless half mossy things that live in the gloom of forests and are only desecrated when brought to scientific light laid out and stretched on a botanic bier sweet old forest days when blue jay and yellow hammer and bobolink made his leaves merry and summer was a long opera of such music as mozart dimly dreamed but then came humankind hustling beneath wondering fussing exploring measuring treading down flowers cutting down trees scaring bobolinks and endover as men say began to be settled staunch men were they these puritan fathers of andover the old oak must have felt them something akin to himself such strong wrestling limbs had they so gnarled and knotted were they yet so outbursting with a green and vernal crown yearly springing of noble and generous thoughts rustling with leaves which shall be for the healing of nations these men were content with a hard dry crust for themselves that they might sow seeds of abundant food for us their children men out of whose hardness and enduring we gain leisure to be soft and graceful through whose poverty we have become rich like moses they had for their portion only the pain and weariness of the wilderness leaving to us the fruition of the promised land let us cherish for their sake the old oak beautiful in its age as the broken statue of some antique wrestler brown with time yet glorious in its suggestion of past achievement i think all of this the more that i have recently come across the following passage in one of our religious papers the writer expresses a kind of sentiment which one meets very often upon this subject and leads one to wonder what glamour could have fallen on the minds of any of the descendants of the puritans that they should cast nettles on those honoured graves where they should be proud to cast their laurels it is hard he says for a lover of the beautiful 
not a mere lover but a believer in its divinity also to forgive the puritans or to think charitably of them it is hard for him to keep forefathers day or to subscribe to the plymouth monument hard to look fairly at what they did with the memory of what they destroyed rising up to choke thankfulness for they were as one-sided and narrow-minded a set of men as ever lived and saw one of the truth's faces only the hard stern practical face without loveliness without beauty and only half dear to god the puritan flew in the face of facts not because he saw them and disliked them but because he did not see them he saw foolishness lying stealing worldliness a very mammon of unrighteousness rioting in the world and bearing sway and he ran full tilt against the monster hating it with a very mortal and mundane hatred and anxious to see it bite the dust that his own horn might be exalted it was in truth only another horn of his old dilemma tossing and goring grace and beauty and all the loveliness of life as if they were the enemies instead of sure friends of god and man now to those who say this we must ask questions with which socrates of old pursued the sophists what is beauty if beauty be only physical if it appeal only to the senses if it be only an enchantment of graceful forms sweet sounds then indeed there might be something of truth in this sweeping declaration that the puritan spirit is the enemy of beauty the very root and foundation of all artistic inquiry lies here what is beauty and to this question god forbid that we christians should give a narrower answer than plato gave in the old times before christ arose for he directs the aspirant who would discover the beautiful to consider of greater value the beauty existing in the soul than that existing in the body more gracefully he teaches the same doctrine when he tells us that there are two kinds of venus beauty the one the elder who had no mother and was the daughter of uranus heaven whom we name the celestial the other younger daughter of jupiter and dion whom we call the vulgar now if disinterestedness faith patience piety have a beauty celestial and divine then were our fathers worshippers of the beautiful if high-mindedness and spotless honor are beautiful things they had those what work of art can compare with a lofty and heroic life is it not better to be a moses than to be a michael angelo making statues of moses is not the life of paul a sublimer work of art than raphael's cartoons are not the patience the faith the undying love of mary by the cross more beautiful than all the madonna paintings in the world if then we would speak truly of our fathers we should say that having their minds fixed on that celestial beauty of which plato speaks they held in slight esteem that more common and earthly should we continue the parable in plato's manner we might say that the earthly and visible venus the outward grace of art and nature was ordained of god as a priestess through whom men were to gain access to the divine invisible one but that men in their blindness ever worshipped the priestess instead of the divinity therefore it is that great reformers so often must break the shrines and temples of the physical and earthly beauty when they seek to draw men upward to that which is high and divine christ says of john the baptist what went ye out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment behold they which are clothed in soft raiment are in king's palaces so was it when our fathers came here there were enough wearing soft raiment and dwelling in king's palaces life in papal rome and prelatic england was weighed down with blossoming luxury there were abundance of people to think of pictures and statues and gems and cameos vases and marbles and all manner of deliciousness the world was all drunk with the enchantments of the lower venus and it was needful that these men should come baptist-like in the wilderness 
in raiment of camel's hair. We need such men now. Art, they tell us, is waking in America. A love of the beautiful is beginning to unfold its wings. But what kind of art? And what kind of beauty? Are we to fill our houses with pictures and gems, and to see that even our drinking cup and vase is wrought in a graceful pattern, and to lose our reverence for self-denial, honor, and faith? Is our Venus to be the frail, ensnaring Aphrodite, or the starry divine Urania? End of chapter 31 Chapter 35 of The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The May Flower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 35 Our Woodlot in Winter. Our Woodlot. Yes, we have arrived at the dignity of owning a woodlot and for us simple folk there is something invigorating in the thought to own even a small spot of our dear old mother earth hath in it a relish of something stimulating to human nature to own a meadow with all its thousandfold fringes of grasses its broidery of monthly flowers and its outriders of birds and bees and gold-winged insects this is something that establishes one's heart to own a clover patch or a buckwheat field is like possessing a self-moving manufactory for perfumes and sweetness but a woodlot rustling with dignified old trees it makes a man rise in his own esteem he might take off his hat to himself at the moment of acquisition we do not marvel that the land acquiring passion becomes a mania among our farmers and particularly we do not wonder at a passion for woodland that wide deep chasm of conscious self-poverty and emptiness which lies at the bottom of every human heart making men crave property as something to add to one's own bareness and to ballast one's own specific levity is sooner filled by land than any thing else your hoary new england farmer walks over his acres with a grim satisfaction he sets his foot down with a hard stamp here is reality no moonshine bank stock no swindling railroads here is his bank and there is no defaulter here all is true solid and satisfactory he seems anchored to this life by it so pope with fine tact makes the old miser making his will on his deathbed after parting with everything die clinging to the possession of his land he disposes with many a groan of this and that house and this and that stock and security but at last the manor is proposed to him the manor hold he cried not that i cannot part with that and died in such terms we discoursed yesterday herr professor and myself while jogging along in an old-fashioned chaise to inspect a few acres of woodlot the acquisition of which had led us with great freshness into these reflections does any fair lady shiver at the idea of a drive to the woods on the first of february let me assure her that in the coldest season nature never wants her ornaments full worth looking at see here for instance let us stop the old chaise and get out a minute to look at this brook one of our last summer's pets what is he doing this winter let us at least say how do you do to him ah here he is and he and jack frost together have been turning the little gap in the old stone wall through which he leaped down to the road into a little grotto of antiparos some old rough rails and boards that dropped over it are sheathed in plates of transparent silver the trunks of the black elders are mailed with crystal and the witch hazel and yellow or sears fringing its sedgy borders are likewise shining through their glossy covering around every stem that rises from the water is a glittering ring of ice the tags of the elder and the red berries of last summer's wild roses glitter now like a lady's pendant as for the brook 
he is wide awake and joyful and where the roof of sheet ice breaks away you can see his yellow-brown waters rattling and gurgling among the stones as briskly as they did last july down he springs over the glossy coated stone wall throwing new sparkles into the fairy grotto around him and widening daily from melting snows and such other godsends he goes chattering off under yonder mossy stone bridge and we lose sight of him it might be fancy but it seemed that our watery friend tipped us a cheery wink as he passed saying fine weather sir and madam nice times these and in april you'll find us all right the flowers are making up their finery for the next season there's to be a splendid display in a month or two then the cloud lights of a wintry sky have a clear purity and brilliancy that no other months can rival the rose tints and the shading of rose tint into gold the flossy filmy accumulation of illuminated vapor that drifts across the sky in a january afternoon are beauties far exceeding those of summer neither are trees as seen in winter destitute of their own peculiar beauty if it be a gorgeous study in summer time to watch the play of their abundant leafage we still may thank winter for laying bare before us the grand and beautiful anatomy of the tree with all its interlacing network of boughs knotted on each twig with the buds of next year's promise the fleecy and rosy clouds look all the more beautiful through the dark lace veil of yonder magnificent elms and the down drooping drapery of yonder willow hath its own grace of outline as it sweeps the bare snows and these comical old apple trees why in summer they look like so many plump green cushions one as much like another as possible but under the revealing light of winter every characteristic twist and jerk stands disclosed one might moralize on this how affliction which strips us of all ornaments and accessories and brings us down to the permanent and solid wood of our nature develops such wide differences in people who before seem not much distinct but here our pony's feet are now clinking on the icy path under the shadow of the white pines of our wood lot the path runs in a deep hollow and on either hand rise slopes dark and sheltered with the fragrant white pine white pines are favorites with us for many good reasons we love their balsamic breath the long slender needles of their leaves and above all the constant sibylline whisperings that never cease among their branches in summer the ground beneath them is paved with a soft and cleanly matting of their last year's leaves and then their talking seems to be of coolness ever dwelling far up in their fringy waving hollows and now in winter time we find the same smooth floor for the heavy curtains above shut out the snow and the same voices above whisper of shelter and quiet you are welcome they say the north wind is gone to sleep we are rocking him in our cradles sit down and be quiet from the cold at the feet of these slumberous old pines we find many of our last summer's friends looking as good as new the small round leafed partridge berry weaves its viny mat and lays out its scarlet fruit and here are blackberry vines with leaves still green though with a bluish tint not unlike what invades mortal noses in such weather here too are the bright varnished leaves of the indian pine and the vines of feathery green of which our christmas garlands are made and here undaunted though frozen to the very heart this cold day is many another leafy thing which we met last summer rejoicing each in its own peculiar flower what names they have received from scientific godfathers at the botanic fount we know not we have always known them by fairy nicknames of our own the pet names of endearment which lie between nature's children and us in her domestic circle there is something peculiarly sweet to us about a certain mystical dreaminess and obscurity in these wild wood tribes which we never wish to have brought out into the daylight of absolute knowledge every one of them was a self-discovered treasure of our childhood as much our own as if god had made it on purpose and presented it and it was ever a part of the joy to think we had found something that no one else knew and so musing on them we gave them names in our heart we search about amid the sere yellow skeletons of last summer's ferns if haply winter have forgotten one green leaf for our home vase in vain we rake freezing our fingers through our fur gloves there is not one 
an icicle has pierced every heart and there are no fern leaves except those miniature ones which each plant is holding in its heart to be sent up in next summer's hour of joy but here are mosses tufts of all sorts the white crisp and crumbling fair as winter frostwork and here the feathery green of which french milliners make moss rosebuds and here the cup moss these we gather with some care frozen as they are to the wintry earth now stumbling up this ridge we come to a little patch of hemlocks spreading out their green wings and making in the ravine a deep shelter where many a fresh springing thing is standing and where we gain much for our home vases these pines are motherly creatures one can think how it must rejoice the heart of a partridge or a rabbit to come from the dry whistling sweep of a deciduous forest under the home-like shadow of their branches as for the stork the fir trees are her house says the hebrew poet and our fir trees this winter give shelter to much small game often on the light fallen snow i meet their little footprints they have a naive helpless innocent appearance these little tracks that softens my heart like a child's footprint not one of them is forgotten of our father and therefore i remember them kindly and now with cold toes and fingers and arms full of leafy treasures we plod our way back to the chaise a pleasant song is in my ears from this old wood lot it speaks of green and cheerful patience in life's hard weather not a scowling sullen endurance not a despairing and dropping resignation but a heart cheerfulness that holds on to every leaf and twig and flower and bravely smiles and keeps green when frozen to the very heart knowing that the winter is but for a season and that the sunshine and bird singing shall return and the last year's dry flower stalk give place to the risen glorified flower end of chapter thirty five our wood lot in winter the charmer a poem by harriet beecher stowe read for labourvox dot org by kathleen socrates however you and simias appear to me as if you wish to sift this subject more thoroughly and to be afraid like children lest on the soul's departure from the body winds should blow it away upon this sebes said endeavour to teach us better socrates perhaps there is a childish spirit in our breast that has such a dread let us endeavour to persuade him not to be afraid of death as of hobgoblins but you must charm him every day said socrates until you have quieted his fears but whence o socrates he said can we procure a skilful charmer for such a case now you are about to leave us greece is wide sebes he replied and in it surely there are skilful men and there are also many barbarous nations all of which you should search seeking such a charmer sparing neither money nor toil as there is nothing on which you can more reasonably spend your money last conversation of socrates with his disciples as narrated by plato in the phaedo we need that charmer for our hearts are sore with longings for the things that may not be faint for the friends that shall return no more dark with distrust or wrung with agony what is life and what to us is death whence came we whither go and where are those who in a moment stricken from our side pass to that land of shadow and repose and are they all dust and dust must we become or are they living in some unknown clime shall we regain them in that far-off home and live anew beyond the waves of time o man divine on thee our souls have hung thou wert our teacher in these questions high but ah this day divides thee from our side and veils in dust thy kindly guiding eye where is that charmer whom thou bidst us seek on what far shores may his sweet voice be heard when shall these questions of our yearning souls be answered by the bright eternal word so spake the youth of athens weeping round when socrates lay calmly down to die so spake the sage prophetic of the hour when earth's fair morning star should rise on high they found him not those youths of soul divine long seeking wandering watching on life's shore reasoning aspiring yearning for the light death came and found them 
doubting as before but years passed on and lo the charmer came pure simple sweet as comes the silver dew and the world knew him not he walked alone encircled only by his trusting few like the athenian sage rejected scorned betrayed condemned his day of doom drew nigh he drew his faithful few more closely round and told them that his hour was come to die let not your heart be troubled then he said my father's house hath mansions large and fair i go before you to prepare your place i will return to take you with me there and since that hour the awful foe is charmed and life and death are glorified and fair whither he went we know the way we know and with firm step press on to meet him there end of poem this recording is in the public domain pilgrim's song in the desert by harriet beecher stowe read for librivox dot org by larry wilson tis morning now upon the eastern hills once more the sun lights up this cheerless scene but oh no morning in my father's house is dawning now for there no light hath been ten thousand thousand now on zion's hills all robed in white with palmy crowns do stray while i an exile far from fatherland still wandering faint along the desert way o home dear home my own my native home o father friends when shall i look on you when shall these weary wanderings be o'er and i be gathered back to stray no more o thou the brightness of whose gracious face these weary longing eyes have never seen by whose dear thought for those beloved sake my course through toil and tears i daily take i think of thee when the myrrh dropping morn steps forth upon the purple eastern steep i think of thee in the fair eventide when the bright sandaled stars their watches keep and trembling hope and fainting sorrow love on thy dear word for comfort doth rely and clear-eyed faith with strong fore-reaching gaze beholds thee here unseen but ever nigh walking in white with thee she dimly sees all beautiful these lovely ones withdrawn with whom my heart went upward as they rose like morning stars to light a coming dawn all sinless now and crowned and glorified where'er thou movest move they still with thee and erst in sweet communion by thy side walked john and mary in old galilee but hush my heart tis but a day or two divides thee from that bright immortal shore rise up rise up and gird thee for the race fast fly the hours and all will soon be o'er thou hast the new name written in thy soul thou hast the mystic stone he gives his own thy soul made one with him shall feel no more that she is walking on her path alone in the poem this recording is in the public domain mary at the cross a poem by harriet beecher stowe read for librivox dot org by larry wilson now there stood by the cross of jesus his mother o wondrous mother since the dawn of time was ever joy was ever grief like thine o highly favored in thy joy's deep flow and favored e'en in this time thy bitterest woe poor was that home in simple nazareth where thou fair growing like some silent flower last of a kingly line unknown and lowly o desert lily past thy childhood's hour the world knew not the tender serious maiden who through deep loving years so silent grew filled with high thoughts and holy aspirations which save thy father god's no eye might view and then it came that message from the highest such as to woman ne'er before descended the almighty shadowing wings thy soul o'erspread and with thy life the life of worlds was blended 
what vision then of future glory filled thee mother of king and kingdom yet unknown mother fulfiller of all prophecy which through dim ages wondering seers have shown well did thy dark eye kindle thy deep soul rise into billows and thy heart rejoice then woke the poet's fire the prophet's song tuned with strange burning words thy timid voice then in dark contrast came the lowly manger the outcast shed the tramp of brutal feet again behold earth's learned and her lowly sages and shepherds prostrate at thy feet then to the temple bearing hark again what strange conflicting tones of prophecy breathe o'er the child foreshadowing words of joy high triumph and yet bitter agony o oh, highly favoured thou in many an hour spent in lone musing with thy wondrous son when thou didst gaze into that glorious eye and hold that mighty hand within thy own blessed through those thirty years when in thy dwelling he lived a god disguised with unknown power and thou his sole adorer his best love trusting revering waitest for this hour blessed in that hour when called by opening heaven with cloud and voice and the baptizing flame up from the jordan walketh acknowledged stranger and awestruck crowds grew silent as he came blessed when full of grace with glory crowned he from both hands almighty favors poured and though he had not where to lay his head brought to his feet alike the slave and lord crowds followed thousands shouted lo our king fast beat thy heart now now the hour draws nigh behold the crown the throne the nations bend and no fond mother no behold him die now by that cross thou takest thy final station and sharest the last dark trial of thy son not with weak tears of woman's lamentation but with high silent anguish like his own hail highly favoured even in this deep passion hail in this bitter anguish thou art blessed blessed in the holy power with him to suffer those deep death pangs that lead to higher rest all now is darkness and in that deep stillness the god man wrestles with that mighty woe hark to that cry the rock of ages rending tis finished mother all is glory now by sufferings mighty as his mighty soul hath the jehovah risen for ever blessed and through all ages must his heart beloved through the same baptism enter the same rest end of poem this recording is in the public domain christian peace a poem by harriet beecher stowe read for librivox dot org by larry wilson thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man thou shalt keep them secretly as in a pavilion from the strife of tongues when winds are raging o'er the upper ocean and billows wild contend with angry roar tis said far down beneath the wild commotion that peaceful stillness reigneth evermore far far beneath the noise of tempest dieth and silver waves chime ever peacefully and no rude storm how fierce soe'er he flieth disturbs the sabbath of that deeper sea so to the heart that knows thy love o purest there is a temple sacred evermore and all the babble of life's angry voices die in hushed stillness at its peaceful door far far away the roar of passion dieth and loving thoughts rise calm and peacefully and no rude storm how fierce soe'er he flieth disturbs the soul that dwells o lord in thee o rest of rests o peace serene eternal thou ever livest and thou changest never and in the secret of thy presence dwelleth fullness of joy for ever and for ever end of poem 
This recording is in the public domain. Abide in me, and I in you, the soul's answer. A poem by Herrick Beecher Stowe, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. That mystic word of thine, O Sovereign Lord, is all too pure, too high, too deep for me. Weary of striving, and with longing faint, I breathe it back again, in prayer to thee. Abide in me, I pray, and I in thee. From this good hour, O oh, leave me nevermore. Then shall the discord cease, the wound be healed, the lifelong bleeding of the soul be o'er. Abide in me, o'ershadowed by thy love, each half-formed purpose and dark thought of sin, quench ere it rise, each selfish low desire, and keep my soul as thine, calm and divine. As some rare perfume in a vase of clay, pervades it with a fragrance not its own so when thou dwellest in a mortal soul all heaven's own sweetness seems around it thrown the soul alone like a neglected harp grows out of tune and needs a hand divine dwell thou within it tune and touch the chords till every note and string shall answer thine abide in me there have been moments pure when i have seen thy face and felt thy power then evil lost its grasp and passion hushed owned the divine enchantment of the hour these were but seasons beautiful and rare abide in me and they shall ever be fulfil at once thy precept and my prayer come and abide in me and i in thee End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When I Awake, I Am Still With Thee A poem by Harriet Beecher Stowe Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Still, still with thee when purple morning breaketh, When the bird waketh and the shadows flee, Fairer than morning, lovelier than the daylight, dawns the sweet consciousness i am with thee alone with thee amid the mystic shadows the solemn hush of nature newly born alone with thee in breathless adoration in the calm dew and freshness of the morn as in the dawning o'er the waveless ocean the image of that morning star doth rest so in this stillness thou beholdest only thine image in the waters of my breast still still with thee as to each new-born morning a fresh and solemn splendor still is given so doth this blessed consciousness awakening breathe each day nearness unto thee in heaven when sinks the soul subdued by toil to slumber its closing eye looks up to thee in prayer sweet the repose beneath thy wings or shading but sweeter still to wake and find thee there so shall it be at last in that bright morning when the soul waketh and life's shadows flee o oh, in that hour fairer than daylight dawning shall rise the glorious thought i am with thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain christ's voice in the soul a poem by harriet beecher stowe Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Come ye yourselves into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, so that they had no time so much as to eat. Mid the mad whirl of life, its dim confusion, its jarring discords and poor vanity, breathing like music over troubled waters, what gentle voice, O Christian, speaks to thee? It is a stranger not of earth or earthly by the serene deep fullness of that eye by the calm pitying smile the gesture lowly is thy saviour as he passeth by come come he saith into a desert place thou who art weary of life's lower sphere leave its low strifes forget its babbling noise come thou with me all shall be bright and clear art thou bewildered by contesting voices 
sick to thy soul of party noise and strife come leave it all and seek that solitude where thou shalt learn of me a purer life when far behind the world's great tumult dieth thou shalt look back and wonder at its roar but its far voice shall seem to thee a dream its power to vex thy holier life be o'er there shalt thou learn the secret of a power mine to bestow which heals the ills of living to overcome by love to live by prayer to conquer man's worst evils by forgiving end of poem this recording is in the public domain end of the mayflower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe